Hello everyone, today is October 10th and we are doing our weekly live stream. We do these at 2 o'clock on Saturday. The first part is usually a topic and then after that I go into question and answer and answer your questions. So if you're asking questions in the beginning, I won't get to you. And typically when you ask a question, it may be 20 minutes before I get to your question to answer you. So if you're feeling ignored or you're asking it over and over and over, it doesn't help. <laughs> I haven't gotten to it yet. So any questions you ask, do add me a little reef and then write your question so I can find it. But in the meantime, I'm going to start a topic and you're going to just have to wait it out or come back later and see what I said in the polished video that YouTube saved. Hi everybody, I see all the people coming into the room. Uh, it's so funny how you can just go live and then boom, they just, everyone pours into the... It's just like giving a talk in public. <laughs> uh, thanks for the heads up on the audio. We are going to talk until the mic dies. I didn't charge it this week, so we'll see how long we last. I'd like to think it'll go for the whole stream, but... Who knows? This is live and anything can go wrong. I'm going to do my best to not let a fly land in my hair because apparently that's a big topic this week. I uh, wanted to talk about moving tanks. Uh, but before I did that, I just wanted to throw this out there. And I don't, I'm not bringing this up over and over because um, I'm looking for sympathy. I'm just raw. <laughs> my mom died last month and today would have been her, her 81st birthday. And so I uh, went back into my YouTube channel and found a video where she popped on screen. Now what I don't know is if the audio is going to come through for you or not, but we're going to try it and see what happens here. Um, she showed up on screen. Uh, this was on December 21st of last year and uh, she popped her head in for just a second. So let's see what happens with this. And if there's no audio, uh, I don't know, tell me. <laughs> of course I won't know and we'll be done with the clip, but eh, here we go. Hello. <laughs> so this is my mom. She's awesome. Merry Christmas. Happy Hanukkah. Happy Kwanzaa. And Happy New Year. Awesome. <laughs> so she'll be here for a whole week if you guys need more of her. <laughs> All right, I hope that audio came through. <laughs> I'm not sure if it did or didn't. Um, so yeah, she popped in once on one of my live streams when she was visiting here. She came to see her great-grandson, my grandson, and uh, we went south a couple of hours to where my son lives. And so we got to hang out, and it was after she returned home she discovered she was sick. So we had a nice uh, unencumbered time together. And today is a very important day to me, and I actually made it really hard to come up with a topic for today's stream because all I'm thinking about is my mom. And uh, I'm sure this is totally normal, but it's n new for me, and I'm, I'm still having to deal with it. So, like I said, I'm not trying to get sympathy. I, you know, everyone's like, I'm so sorry. I just had to share it because this is her day, and uh, it'll always be her day once a year. I think that is the day I'll commemorate. I think I'd rather, I don't know, what do you do? Do you commemorate the birth date of your parent that's died or do you uh, commemorate the day they died? Uh, I'd love to know your answers. Um, I don't know, maybe I'm handling it wrongly, but I, I'm thinking the birthday. Probably because I celebrated every year with her, you know, since I was a kid. Uh, Alright, so today's topic. We are going to go in and make sure we have audio. <laughs> yeah, today's topic we're going to talk about moving a tank. And uh, I put in the link of this, this video's description a link to an article I did or a very brief article I did on Reef Addicts I don't know, 10 years ago, where it was talking about swapping the stand out from under the aquarium. But a lot of times we have to move the aquarium. We have to move from one apartment to another. We have to move the tank from one room to another. We have a tank that fails and has to be replaced. We want to upgrade. I mean, there's so many reasons why we end up with an aquarium. It could even be a buddy said, hey, I am done with this hobby. And you're like, I've always wanted to try it. And he's like, I'll give you a hell of a deal. Just get this out of my house. And then you've suddenly taken on this massive project. So... I guess it, it's going to come down to how much effort is involved is how big the tank is. So I thought what we could do today is story time. And uh, hopefully, <laughs> most of you know how the stream works. A few people tend to come into the chat and say, 
you take way too long to get to the point, you know, I just want to be in and out, and you suck, and you know, I was like, no, I, this is just, you're on the wrong channel, this is my channel, this is how I handle it, we've been doing it for a couple of years, we live together, we chat, it's like a, I compare this show to like a morning show on the radio where they go on for three or four hours, and uh, the conversation just evolves, and you feel like you're part of the family, and you guys are all part of this family, and you know, so we do story time on Saturday sometimes, and this one is going to be kind of a fun one. So I'm going to go way, way back to mid-2004, and uh, there was a guy in our club, his name was Gary, and he was looking for a big tank. He says, I want to upgrade Mark, and I said, all right, you know, no problem, I'll keep my eyes open, and then I stumbled on a heck of a deal for him. It was a 280-gallon tank that was with, made with Starfire glass, it came with a stand, it came with a sump, it had a skimmer, calcium reactor, live rock, livestock, and it was only six months old. And I said to him, hey, I found you a great deal. And he said, well, how much is it? And if I recall correctly, this thing was $2,500. And I mean, that was a really good deal for that size tank. So he agreed to it. And I wasn't the middleman. I just helped connect two people, but I wasn't like handling this thing. And it was two in the morning. I get a, uh, I guess an email from him back then. And he says, Mark, it's way too big a tank. I can't take it on. I, I, I want to get out from under it. You know. I said, you haven't even gotten it yet. <laughs> and he said, just make me a list of everything I need uh, so I can sell it. I want to put this list up and I want to sell uh, this to someone else. I don't want to leave that guy high and dry. I agreed to buy it. And so I'm typing up the list and I was just like, man, this is such a good deal. I can't believe he's not going to take this tank. So I, I wrote him back again. This is all through email. Like I said, no text. <laughs> it's 2004, people. And uh, I said to him, let me think about this for 24 hours. I might buy it myself because it was such a good deal. And uh, then, you know, the next day I decided rather than making a house payment, I'm just going to buy this tank. <laughs> and so I, I bought the tank. And the guy lived about three quarters of a mile from my door. So the, the person that was, uh, we were picking it up. And uh, I thought, well, how am I going to get this tank here? So, of course, I rounded up a bunch of friends. I rented a U-Haul trailer, a uh, U-Haul truck the kind that has the box on the back with a ramp that goes down. And I got furniture dollies. I got straps. Um, we might have got ourselves a few suction cups from the local fish stores that were nearby. And I brought a bunch of trash cans. I brought tubing. So you see, this is a good story for moving a tank. I mean, this is literally, I lived it. And this is just one of many trips, uh, one of many stories. So I had this uh, big U-Haul truck. Everyone showed up. We all piled in to the truck, and whoever didn't fit in the truck followed with their cars, and we went three quarters of a mile away to this house, and we pulled up, and you know when we got inside, this tank was on its stand, and it was ready to go, but I mean, it was full of water. There was still fish swimming around in it. Spock was in it. Uh, the Crown Royal, the purple tang was in it. Um, some other fish, too. And all these, uh, you know, everyone was like, what do you want us to do? I said, well, the first thing we should do is we should drain out the water and into a trash can and then move the fish into the trash can. Because as you drain out the water and it becomes more and more shallow, it's easier to catch the fish. Now, the rock, unfortunately, from this, uh, this system was sold before I bought it. Uh, what had happened was Gary had already promised a live rock to someone else. And so I ended up getting an entire system with the most important biological filtration not included. Uh, so anyway, I was like, whatever. I've got live rock. I'll make it work. And at the time, I had a 29-gallon and I had a 55-gallon. So I was going from two small tanks to one that was quite a bit larger. And we got the tank off the stand with a lot of muscle, and we lowered it down onto four salt buckets rather than putting it on the floor directly. And the reason I thought we should do that is because that tank was heavy. And my concern was, once it was on the floor, we'd never pick it up again. <laughs> so we put these four buckets of salt in the corners, and set it down, and then we could move the dollies underneath, and we could kind of work the buckets out and lower the tank down onto these rolling dollies. And um, at that point, we I had brought straps along, like the orange ratchet straps you get at Home Depot, and we strapped around the tank and around the dolly, and we forced it down the hallway, which was very, very narrow. It was just enough room to get the tank through this hallway and barely pivoted out the front door and over the threshold. And then all of us worked together to push it up the ramp and into the back of the truck. Then we hauled the big barrels of salt water that we had collected, you know, with the fish and uh, anything else. And there was one trash can just filled with, salt, oh, with sand as well. And all that went into the truck. We grabbed all our stuff, um, 
and um, we were on our way here. And when we pulled up to my house, I remember distinctly, one of the people said, well, where's the group that's going to unload it? Because <laughs> they did their shift. We're second shift. And I was like, yeah, I know. I totally understand it. I mean, we just spent, I don't know, it probably took us a couple of hours just to do this. And we were wiped out. We didn't want to do this. So I know I had Toll House cookies. I probably ordered some pizzas and had some drinks here because that's usually what I do. One of my uh, techniques for getting people to come over and help is to fill up the washing machine with all kinds of beverages and then pour ice all over it. And they can just lift the lid and grab a drink. And uh, this was a great system because everything stays nice and cold. It's all in one spot. Everyone knows where to find it. And then when you're all done and all the drinks have been removed, you can just put the machine on spin cycle and it'll drain the water out and boom, you have nothing to clean up. So there's nothing in the way. And uh, so everyone got their drinks and everyone had their, their cookies or whatever we had, pizza, I don't remember. And then it was time to haul it inside the house. And when we uh, tried to do that, it was basically the same principle. Again, we put the dollies on the, on, well, the tank was still connected. So we got it down the ramp and up the step here and then through the front door and hauled it into here and it went into this spot. Um, now, before that actual move happened, I had been preparing this spot behind me for where the tank was gonna be. And that's a huge build thread on Reef Central if you wanna go hunt it down. Um, I did this thread, I started the thread in 2004. Uh, a lot of times people would do a build thread from the beginning, but when I joined Reef Central, I already had a tank and so there was no build thread. It was already done. Here's my tank. <laughs> so I said, finally, I can do one from the beginning. This would be really cool. And I told everyone I'm going to get this tank in two weeks and I'm going to, you know, set it up. And everyone's like, you're going to set up a 280 gallon reef in two weeks. And I was like, sure. Why can't, why, why would that be a problem? And they're like, you're out of your mind. And then they'd say things like, and I'm subscribed. I got to see this one. So each day leading up to day 14, I was preparing that room with my buddy, Evan, and we worked together on there. We built the stand. You know, we cut out the sheetrock to make a room for the, where the tank was going to go. Um, ran some circuits into there. Uh, installed a vent fan in the ceiling. I installed a window unit in the wall to blow cool air to keep the room nice and cool so that the tank wouldn't need a chiller. Um, what else? What else did we do to prepare it? That's pretty much it for that initially. And then when we showed up with the tank... Uh, we got the tank onto the stand that was built, which was fine. It was it was perfectly you know set up for that, and we hauled it in. Boom, that was done. And then we had to bring in the sump, and the sump was an 80 gallon sump that was made of glass. It was so heavy. It took four of us to get it in here, and there was about this much space between the edge of the sump and the bottom of the stand. It was such a tall sump. I hated it from the moment we got it, but I thought, what am I going to do? It came with a sump, so we jammed it in there, and. Uh, Water would drain into one end, and then it would rush into the next zone that was supposed to be the refugium. Then it would rush into the next zone, which was, uh, I guess, the return zone. It was it was a terrible glass box. I don't know who made it, but it was terrible. And you couldn't even put a skimmer in there because we had no vertical height. So I had to put the skimmer outside of the sump, standing on a big salt uh, salt bucket to get it to the right height. And uh, so we got it plumbed in. We got the plumbing done. We got it connected. And... In the meantime, while all we were, while I was doing all that plumbing work, I had my friend John outside washing all the sand. Now I did a video on this stream or on this channel about how to wash sand, and he washed bucket after bucket out of buck after bucket of sand to make sure it was nice and clean. Now why did he wash it? And that's part of why we're talking about this today. If the tank is six months or younger, you can usually use the sand bed. But because I knew nothing but the history of this tank, I didn't take any chances. And I, even though I knew it was six months old. I made him wash all the sand. And while he did that, as he came in with a new clean bucket, he poured that right into the tank and then he went outside into the next one. And so he made a trip here, I don't know, every five or 10 minutes, he'd come in with another bucket of sand and we would add it to the tank. In the meantime, while that was going on, we were also breaking down the 29 gallon and breaking down the 55 gallon and taking all that live rock and picking off all the mushrooms because I said no mushrooms in the new tank. And I had a guy sitting in the middle of the floor on a tarp and he was scraping off every mushroom he could find until the rock was clean. I said, that's your only job. You just sit here and you remove every mushroom you can. There was thousands. I said, just get rid of every last one of them. I don't want to see a mushroom. And he's like, okay. And I said, I don't care how long it takes you. <laughs> just don't do anything but this. And he worked really hard. And he ripped off thousands of mushrooms. I mean, there was, they were all over the place. And, uh, you know, we put the rock in the tank. and kind of did this arranged uh, aquascape through sort of cloudy water. 
got clean sand, used rock, and uh, I had made a whole bunch of salt water in advance. I had these barrels full of salt water ready to go, and we had some water that we'd moved with us, so we had enough to get the tank filled up and draining down into the sump and make sure that the return pump and all that was not leaking or dripping or anything like that. And uh, we didn't have any lights on the tank initially. And that was done on day 14. I actually hit my deadline, which was great. And out of those 14 days, there was only one day, I think it was day 11, where I physically could not work on anything for the tank. I had to do some work, you know, for my business. And I took one day off to actually do my job. And then every other minute for those 13 days, I, I and Evan both were both working on this to knock it out to make sure it would happen. And uh, Evan was a great guy. He didn't know that I was in the same town he was in. And uh, I believe it was, yeah, it was definitely after this. So we basically, we were ready. We knew each other on Reef Central, but we didn't know we lived in the same town. And then he came over to help with this project because he says, I love this. This is so fun. And I mean, we built walls for the room and, you know, hung a door in there and, uh, you know, all the things we did, he got to be an active part of it. And he just jumped in, you know, with both feet. And it was, it was great. And then a couple years later, because our friendship had continued to grow, we ended up doing a podcast for three years. And we talked about all kinds of reef keeping things, just like I do now here on YouTube. Uh, and that podcast was called Reefcast. I have a bunch of those episodes and uh, he had the website going for a very long time. But the uh, podcast feed wasn't working, so I, you know, I, I don't think they're findable on the web this day. You know, I mean, yeah, they always say you can find it once it's on the internet; it's there, but I can't find it. So, at some point, I'm gonna have to figure out a way to re-release those to where you guys can hear them, because really, the things we talked about, 90% of it still pertains, and there's just a few things that don't make any sense at this point. You know, things we were talking about, like this is on sale this week. Well, that was years ago. <laughs> so, the livestock went in, and of course, the next thing I did after this tank was running was to test all the water parameters to make sure everything was solid. You know, I was obviously I tested before, but because I want to always make sure that the water in the tank matches the water in the barrel of fish. So that way there's no problem. And the fish were in that trash can for a really long time sitting in the kitchen. So they had a heater and they had an air pump and we would constantly check on them to see that they were swimming and they were okay and there was no fighting. There was no panic. They really were just kind of out of sorts, but they weren't acting they were being very cautious. You know, they, they didn't swim around like they were comfortable because, of course, they weren't. They'd just been caught, put in a trash can, hauled, you know, three-quarters of a mile, dragged into a kitchen, and then heard all this crazy stuff going on around them. But uh, when we put the fish into the tank, they all started swimming around, and then over the next few hours, the water got more and more clear. So that is kind of a, a brief overview of a big project. And the 14-day... Um, project itself is is actually on my website it's a monster couple of pages or maybe it's one huge page i don't know i grabbed most of my biggest posts from reef central way back then and i just grabbed the text and pasted it into my website so you could read post after post after post of day one through day 14. and so if you want to read that and kind of live it you can it, it's available on the website i'll be sure to add that one to this video's description after uh, this uh, video has concluded so you can check it out so now, if you are trying to move across the room, it's still a lot of work. But it's more work to take it and go to another building. <laughs> to, to go bring a tank from an office to a home, to bring it from your home maybe to, I don't know, if let's say it's a small tank, take it to your dorm, or uh, you're moving into an apartment, or you're moving from one apartment to another. All these things will dictate what's involved. And, What's even more important is knowing if you have to go up a bunch of stairs, if you have to go down a bunch of stairs, or if it's level. Uh, you want to know if the floor underneath where the tank is going to go is solid and can handle the weight. You want to make sure there's electricity near where the tank is going to be, so that way you're, uh, you have a place to plug everything in. And no matter how many plugs you think you have, you never have enough. I'm telling you that. I'm just giving you a heads up right now. So if you um, can... And if your tank is semi-big, I mean, you know, I, uh, it's so hard to say big on this channel because everyone looks at things differently. You know, if somebody has a three-gallon tank, like, oh, well, anything is bigger than that. And then, you know, I, I mentioned like 400 gallons, and then there's someone that has an 800, or there's someone that has a 1,000 gallon, or, or, you know, whatever. So all these people have these tanks of different sizes, and we all look at things in different scales. But I really like to have two circuits near any aquarium I run, not just one. And the reason being, if for some reason that circuit breaker pops, everything plugged into that 
outlet or a couple of outlets will just be off and they'll be off until you come home and notice. So if you can have two circuits and can divide your equipment across two, even if one turns off and half the tank is off, the other half is still running. And that gives your tank some time to survive when it's time to uh, you know, come home and handle whatever happened. You know, let's say a heater shorted out and tripped the breaker. The other breaker's still going, so you still have you know, a gyre moving the water in the tank, for example, or something along those, those lines. Uh, or maybe you have a cooling fan that you've always had on the corner of your tank, and today it falls in and trips that breaker. Well, the other breaker's still going, so the return pump's still turning. Now, it's not great conditions, what I just described, but at least there's some water movement until you can address the situation and handle it. So, two circuits is what I had on my 29 gallon. <laughs> I had one, you know, I had the plug in there, and that plug also went with the rest of the living room. So, like, the television was on, the surround sound was on, my, I, I think I had a computer plugged in, and from time to time, the entire room would go dead because I had too many things plugged in. So by having a, a second circuit brought in, I saw an electrician driving his little pickup truck down the road and the phone number was on the back window. And I wrote it down and when I got home, I called him up and said, can you please put a second circuit in? And he ran a wire from that wall all the way through the ceiling and to the breaker panel and gave it its own little breaker and I had two. And so I, I had him put in one of those GFI and then I had just the regular breaker and I divided my equipment across it accordingly and never had any uh, major issues. So that's what I'm recommending. So I was doing that for a 29 gallon. And that's not a big tank. So I recommend multiple circuits. The fish room behind me right here has a total of six circuits, six breakers, three are regular breakers, three are GFI. And uh, I have divided my equipment across that accordingly and how I felt was the need. And uh, ventilation is really important near your aquarium because it takes out the humidity from the room. So if you can plan on that, again, we're talking about, it depends on the size of the aquarium. It really depends on the size of the water volume in your home or in that room. But uh, having the electrical done in advance for you start to move the tank is key because it'll save you time. And having a bunch of salt water ready is very important. And then, like I said earlier, knowing that the floor can support the weight of the tank is so important. And you're, think about this, you know, you say, well, it's a 100 gallon tank. Uh, you know, let's just say a gallon of water is 10 pounds, which is guessing upward a little bit. So you're looking at a thousand pounds. And then we've got our, uh, our stand, we've got the aquarium itself, we've got sand, we've got rock. You know, maybe it all adds up to 2,000 pounds. But it's 2,000 pounds in an area that is eight square feet. It's four foot by two foot. So you have one very small footprint that has 2,000 pounds pressing straight down. If the house is a slab foundation or the apartment or the dorm or whatever, yeah, it can handle the weight, especially if it's on the foundation on the bottom floor. When you go up to the upper floors, they're built differently. And which way the uh, the joists run through the floor, if they're going uh, perpendicular or if they're going parallel, can affect how the tank sits. And one of the things you could do is basically bounce up and down in that spot and just see how the floor feels. Just to kind of know. I mean, yeah, you can get, you can get. Let's see, five or ten people to stand in one tiny spot and all bounce together. <laughs> um, or you could, you know, put a table and put some bottles of water there and then bounce around and see what happens. Again, you want to know how solid the floor is because you need to make sure it's okay. And if you really don't know, if you absolutely have no clue, then you should. Hire someone that does. You know, you should get an expert of some kind and not someone that says, yeah, I think it'll be all right. That's a terrible plan. You want to literally know you're good to go. Um, a structural engineer is the ideal. Uh, of course, they need to see the plans. Can they get to the plans? You know, that's a question that is valid. Is there any way of knowing which way the boards run on the floor? If this is a pier and beam home, you can crawl under and you can look. And you can reinforce that area. It is so easy to do this. And a lot of people don't. All you have to do is crawl under the house, get a 4x4 four four post that goes directly under the joists that are the floor. So the joists are the supporting beams, and then they have the decking, and then they have pretty hardwood or whatever. And you put that 4x4 four four post under there, and you take some concrete block, and you make pillars, set the post on top, take some shims, and wedge them into each of those joists, and now you can come back in the house, and you can jump up and down, and it will feel like you're jumping on stone. It'll feel rock solid. You're like, perfect. Now it's ready for an aquarium. And if the aquarium's already there, you can still do this. 
you can still get under there. You can put in the uh, the pillars. They're called piers. You can put the 4x4 post. You can do some oak shims. You can tap them in. You can go inside. And you can actually walk in front of that tank and see if the tank rocks. And if it does, tap the shims in a little further and get back up in there and do it back and forth. And you'll find that you've made the entire room so much more structurally uh, supported. And uh, you'll never have to worry about it being weak. You won't have to watch your tank bounce. You won't. And it's also really important. This is something a lot of people don't think about. Um, if the floor is being, I mean, if the floor, if the tank is being put on carpet, carpeted floors, and they like to put the tank as close to the wall as possible. I don't recommend that because there's usually a tack strip in the very back, you know, near the edge of the wall, about this far away. It's got all these little nails sticking up, and it's about the strip's about this tall, and then you got the nail sticking up to hook the carpet on, and they stretch it. And if you put the stand on top of the carpet and on the tack strip, it's literally leaning forward slightly. So your whole tank is like... And, yeah, you could put a shim under here to bring it up, but it's so much better to just bring the tank away from the wall three inches and then set it up. And this gives you room to run pipes down behind if you need to. Uh, you, can run the, you can snake the wires down there you know, for the, you know, the lights or pumps or heaters or whatever it is you've got to hook up. But having a little bit of space gets you away from that tack strip and helps keep the tank nice and solid. Also, um, where was I? I was thinking about something else. If the floors, hardwood floors, some people won't think, well, maybe I should put down some kind of protective barrier and then put the stand on top. There's no point. Uh, if you spill water, it's gonna go under the tank, it's gonna go under your protective barrier, and you're gonna have a big damp area that's just gonna ruin the wood there anyway. So. Your best thing is to always throw it on towels when you're working around the tank to catch those spills and understand too that you might have to replace that wood later when the tank gets moved. It will. It, it could even just get discolored from not seeing the light of day for six years. You know, you could just have this perfectly dark area of, of uh, hardwood floors and all the rest of it looks a little weathered and beaten because it's been walked all over and it's had daylight hitting it and it's, you know, had, life has hit it. But that spot was untouched and so it won't look like the rest of the room. So there may be something you have to do to help refinish the floors and make them look good one day. So that's just something to keep in mind. Um, still something nagging in the back of my brain that I was thinking of as I was telling you the thing about the tax strips, but I can't think of it right. Oh yeah, tanks need to be level. <laughs> See, I knew there was something important. Your tank must be level, and you should level it before you put water in it, and then you should put water in it, and you should level it again. And I don't recommend a tiny little level. You know, some people have something, you know, just like this little plastic thing you put in your back pocket and, and the tank is, you know, eight feet long. That is not the way to level something. You need an eight-foot level for an eight-foot tank. Uh, if you just take something small and put it on there, it's not going to give you an accurate read of the entire thing. And you're going to want to level front to back. You want to run, uh, run it horizontal, you know, full length. And then you could even do diagonals and just kind of make sure all the corners are up. And I'll tell you a trick about shims. Let me get a shim. So here's a wooden shim. I have a whole bunch of these. And uh, they're usually, you know, it's a thick area that comes down to a very tight notch. Now, you can buy plastic ones. You can buy wooden ones. I just make my own. But uh, you would take the shim, and ideally you're going to focus on the front two corners because the tank is almost always leaning slightly forward. Very rare you're going to be shimming the back of the tank. It's usually the front. And one of the reasons we shim the front also is so no one can pull the tank over on top of them. So it's smart to do. But you've got this shim that, you know, whatever that length is, you're probably going to need about this much under here, and then, you know, like this much. And then all this is excess that's sticking out, and it's hideous. You don't want to look at that for the rest of your life. So you take your shim, you put it under the stand, you tap it with a hammer a couple times to wedge it, and then you take a chisel and you set it right on top and you take that hammer and you hit it and you score the shim all the way across. So you might have to tap and tap and tap. You know, I have to do three spots, depends on the width of your chisel. And now that there's a score, you can put the chisel under the remaining part of the shim and you can pry straight up through leverage and this will snap off. And now you'll have this serrated area where the rest of the shim is still under there and this big piece is gone. Holding this piece, you push it up against the shim and you tap it once or twice more and then you throw this away and now the shim is completely invisible. So we tap it under the stand as far as it goes, take the chisel, tap down, score it, snap it off, use this as a bumper, tap it in a couple times, 
and now you'll have just this part under the tank and this part will be gone and it'll look really nice. You won't even know it even exists. And you can use them several places, but normally where you need it most is the corners. Let me remind my best friend that I am streaming like she does every Saturday. Punk. <laughs> okay, so we got our tank level. We've put water in it. We've verified it's still level. And you know what? You might say, well, I don't own an eight-foot level. I don't want to buy an eight-foot level. Well, technically, you're going to use this for all of five minutes. I don't normally recommend this, but if you had to buy an eight-foot level and you never, ever, ever think you'll use it again, you could bring it back because you're going to set it on top and then you're done. <laughs> you didn't get it wet. You didn't get it ruined. You didn't damage it in any way. And you're back at Home Depot an hour later and like, I didn't need this after all. <laughs> uh, I don't usually push people that direction. I'm more about buy a tool, own a tool, and you always have that tool for whenever you're doing something in the future. But, you know, I kind of get it, you know, so, um, you know, just something to, you know, please use the right tool for the job. It's so important. Now, um... I guess, and then finally, you know, with the tank reset up or the tank set up newly, the next thing that you'll have to do is constantly scrutinize it and look at everything from every angle. Keep double checking on it. Make sure that the flow is still happening. Make sure you got your lights suspended and installed properly where they're not going to fall into the tank. Make sure that the water is getting more and more clear. Make sure the skimmer is running properly and uh, test your water daily to avoid any kind of disaster because when you set up a new tank and you, you're introducing a lot of livestock at once, or if you're uh, moving and transferring livestock, like I did, to the, I took the livestock from the 29, I put the livestock from the 55, all in the 280, with the fish I got that came with the 280, all my livestock had to survive, and we had to stay on top of the water quality every single day for about a week or two, just make sure there's no ammonia spike, there's no surprises, and that way if there was some kind of a spike, I could stop it. So I uh, just wanted to emphasize that. Closes. Um, all right. Let's see. That's pretty much, you know, the highlights of what you need to know for moving a tank. Let's see how we're doing on battery. Ooh, this thing is getting low. We'll see how long this stream lasts. <laughs> I'm uh, about to start looking at your questions. The biggest thing I can tell you when it comes to moving a tank is having everyone understand that this is what you're doing today. If you are moving from one house to another with a family, with kids, with pets, okay, with dogs, cats, hamsters, I don't know, and you have an aquarium, you need to tell everyone in your family, on Saturday, I'm moving the tank, and I can't help you with anything, and it's going to take me all day. It might take 12 hours for me to do this. It might take me 14 hours. I literally cannot help you with your bookcase. I can't help unpack dishes. I need you to understand this is living animals, and I have to get the setup as perfectly as I can so that the livestock will be okay. And if you tell everyone up front what's happening, it will avoid a lot of fights, okay? And you say, look, I love you guys. I want to help you with all your stuff, and I don't want to be a jerk, but... Everything in my aquarium relies on me to stay alive, and I have to be 100% focused on that. I can't do anything. Matter of fact, if you can bring me a slice of pizza from time to time, that would be great. <laughs> but I cannot help you move dressers or anything else, and I need nothing to be in my way while I'm moving this tank in. And if you bring a bunch of friends over to help, you want to make sure that the hallway is completely uncluttered. You don't want extension cords running across it. You don't want rolls of carpet against the wall. I mean... Nothing should be, the path from where the tank is coming in through the door should be completely clear. The area where the tank's going to be should be completely clear. There shouldn't be clutter. There shouldn't be boxes. There shouldn't be a sofa in the way. I mean, it should be, you, you have a direct path to what you're doing, and you're going to be taking over that room and working in that room until you're done. And then the second thing is you want to make sure you have plenty of salt water on hand so that if anything goes really wrong, you still have a bunch more that you can keep pouring into the tank to fix for example, you have someone spill a bunch of it all over the floor. And you're like, that's 20 gallons all over the floor, but I need 20 more gallons now in, in a hurry. So having tons of salt water ready is going to be your best bet for making sure the livestock will be okay while, um, you know, they're, while, while you have people shot vacuuming the floor. 
<laughs> to get that back to normal. Okay, that's it for that. I think we've covered it pretty much. We'll see what happens here with um, the comments. You might have more things that you would suggest, and uh, I'd be happy to incorporate those. The question and answer period of the live stream each week is about anything, whether it's the topic or it's anything you have on your mind. And I just answer them for as long as I can until I finally say I've had enough, and then I end the stream. So today, um, we're <laughs> fighting the clock on how long the batteries last on the, the microphone. Alrighty. Grandin says he just had to move from a 125 gallon to a 220, but still in the same house. And how did it go? You didn't tell us anything. Come on, Brandon. Let's see. <laughs> oh, uh, while well, I haven't got to the question part yet, this week of the reef tank, what's changed? What happened? What, what broke? <laughs> because every week something has to happen, right? And the last few weeks have been going pretty well. A um, couple little things occurred in the tank, which it's annoying me. I'm starting to think more and more that the big RTN event that happened was related to my leather coral. I normally would not attribute it to that coral, but that leather is just a miserable ball of grossness in the back of my reef. And there's one branch here that turned white, and there's a couple of more spots that don't look so healthy. And then there's a little tiny bit down in that corner that turned white. And the leather itself barely is extending polyps, and part of it looks gross. And I think I'm just going to frag a piece off and throw away the rest, because I think it's a toxic ball of death, and I think it's just affecting my tank. And uh, so that's a minor little nuisance. It doesn't make me uh, worry about my reef at all. It's a very small little loss that happened. And I just think it's that thing. <laughs> I don't think it's anything else because water's been dead on. Um, and then this metal halide was off last Saturday. And I think it was Monday or Tuesday. I was like, okay, I need to fix that light. And I wasn't sure what it was. I don't know if it was the bulb. I don't know if it was the ballast. I don't know if it was the socket. It's usually one of those three things. And I got up there, and it seemed like the ballast didn't work. So I grabbed my backup ballast, which I saved, but I had a feeling wasn't good. And I tried to hook it up, and it didn't work either. I was like, ah! So I called Reef Bride up and said, please send me two more ballasts, so that way I'd have one and a backup. And the ballast arrived yesterday. So I said, yay, because what I did in the meantime for light each day was the ballast that runs this light I would unplug it and I plugged in this light to get five hours of light on this end of the tank. And then after five hours, I would unplug it, let it, you know, just for a second, and then I would plug in this light and get five more hours. And that's how I was keeping both ends of the reef lit with a single ballast. And um, I discovered that my energy bar that has eight outlets in it that, you know, the Apex uses to turn things on and off, the this is the second outlet on that energy bar that has stayed in the on position. It won't turn off. Now, I don't know if a dying ballast kills the outlet, but let's just say it did. So in the meantime, I have a new, because I have a stash of backup parts always, energy bar ready to go on the tank, and I need to go up onto the light rack and just take the old one off, put the new one on, plug everything in, make sure the addresses are correct, and everything be back to normal. And then I think I'll ask uh, Neptune Systems if they can fix my old energy bar because there are still six good outlets on it out of eight. And, uh, you know, maybe I can get it repaired and I have a, a fully functional backup again because I like to keep things on hand in case I need it. It's not an absolute necessary thing because I have backups of backups and there's another energy bar back there in my back room. So I could go with that. But, you know, I just hate things that are broken. So I have two outlets that will never turn off. And unless I can plug something into it that always has to be on, it's a it's kind of a waste and a nuisance. So I solved the problem. I ordered a new ballast. You know, it cost me 300 bucks for a ballast. And uh, now I have a brand new one to sit on the shelf in case anything else breaks. And I got the lights functional as of yesterday. So that's good news. All right. Uh, Mr. Reefbuster says, What are your thoughts on metal stands that rust and the rust possibly getting into the sump since it's under the stand? What are the risks? Oh, that's a great question. 
My stand itself is a steel stand. Uh, I had it welded by a guy in 2009, and I told him I want it powder, powder coated. And he said, yeah, no problem, and you, know, you have to pay extra for that. And that's supposed to protect from rust. Now, what you can do if you have a stand that is rusting, you can go ahead and you can sand it down where it's rusting, and then you can apply a paint made for metal to seal it up again. So you might have to do a primer first and then a coat. I would obviously protect the sump, because you said, what about things falling in the sump? You may have to remove the sump for this and tackle the area that's bad. Normally, it's not going to be the entire stand is rusting. I would hope not. But you'll have like a troublesome spot that you notice, and it needs to be addressed. And uh, if you do that, if you're being proactive and you're inspecting it and looking carefully, you can correct little minor nuisances and touch it up and extend the life of the stand. Now, if you are seeing problems everywhere, or if you're starting to see that the tank is shifting and wiggling, or if you see that some of the welds are letting go, then you just have to replace the stand anyway. And at that point, you can get a new stand and make sure it's powder coated. We don't, just getting a stand that's painted isn't good enough. The powder coated is a technique that makes this stuff adhere to the steel and helps it be way more re uh, resistant to rust. But there's no absolute 100% it'll never rust scenario. There's always something that happens or it's not thick enough or whatever, uh, something spattered on it long, long term and it finally just eroded through. So you may have to touch it up. All right, let's talk about this, because I really talked about fish only. Um, Huang says, I'm going to watch the stream all the way through because I'm moving. I need to know how to keep my livestock alive. So if you're moving tanks, now, okay, so this is a whole other, <laughs> I can come up with 20 more minutes. Uh, one of the things that a lot of reef keepers try to do, uh, they get a new job in a totally different state, and they are moving from California to Florida or some nutty thing, and they said, I'm going to take all my corals and I'm going to bag them up, and I'm going to put them in a cooler, I'm going to drive across America, and I'm going to unpack them, and they're going to live. And I'm telling you, it does not work. Can one person do it? Maybe. But can 99 other people do it? No. It's, it just doesn't work. You end up losing about 80% of your livestock. It's heartbreaking, and you spend so much time hoping and trying so hard to get them from one destination to the next alive. It's very stressful. You're, you're constantly you know, alert and worried and checking, and it, it's just such a nightmare. And then you finally get there, and the tank does not set up as quickly as you hoped. And you know, because of those delays, the livestock's suffering even more. And, you know, and then you know, if you're stuck on the side of the road because you, know, you had to wait for AAA, uh, all these things, there's so many things that can go wrong. And there was a guy at a beautiful SPS reef, and he was in California, and he was going somewhere east. I can't remember what state. Let's just say Tennessee. Maybe that. Maybe it was further. Maybe it was Atlanta, Georgia. And he said, I'm going to do it successfully. I'm going to document it. I'm going to tell everyone how to do this. It's going to be a great story. And he packed up everything. He had the fish store involved. They bagged everything up. They put air in the bags. You know, They used the coolers. They taped everything shut. They packed it in the truck. It was a climate-controlled truck. You know, He had it all figured out. And then as he was driving somewhere around El Paso, the trailer disconnected from the truck, and I guess the chains are still on, and so when he hit the brakes, the trailer rammed into the back of the truck and punched a hole right through the end of the sump. And it was a brand new sump that never had a drop of water in it, and that sump was going to go under the tank at a new destination. And he was so upset, and he contacted me and says, Mark, I'm going to be driving through Dallas. Can you fix the end of that sump for me? you know, as, you know, we're coming through. <laughs> I said, I can fix it, but not like that, not instantly. I mean, you could drop it off as you keep heading. And you know what? Maybe he didn't go to Atlanta. Maybe the destination was somewhere in Dallas because he had to come later to pick up the sump after I fixed it. And I ended up cutting off the entire end of the sump and pasting a new piece onto the end. And it did not look exactly like it originally did because what I had to do was a band-aid a band situation to a, a really bad scenario. But fixed it. Um, and then he later picked it up and, you know, uh, but the livestock didn't make it because he had no sump. See, something went wrong. And he said that whole plan I had was ruined. 
Um, but if you are trying to move livestock, you know, in a short move, you know, a few hours, you know, from one place to another, it's more doable. The other challenge is you may have grown little frags into nice colonies, and then when you're setting up your new tank, you have these big colonies, and you put one in here, and you put one in here, and you put one in here, and you're like, well, I'm going to do all the rest of these corals. I have no room left because they're colonies, and they're big, and they eat up a lot of real estate, and you find yourself in a situation where you just can't make it work. So my friend Dwayne, who's the king of ripping down a reef every year, he always says, get rid of the big colony and save something the size of your fist and put those in there. And you have these mini colonies and your tank won't look brand new. And you'll have something nice to look at and it'll fill in nicely over the next nine months to a year. And, you know, he's not wrong. And so if you are trying to move, if you have this beautiful tabling acre or you have this giant scrolling Montipora, Take out the middle piece and save that. Get the frags to people in your area, bring to the fish store, whatever you got to do, and save the best of the best and use that to start your, your new setup. That will be better. Keeping them all healthy and alive is going to be really hard. The faster you can make the move happen, the better. Benefit of having other people helping you on tank move day would be great because one guy can be working on plumbing, another guy's working on the sand, another guy is working on getting the, the rocks stacked in there, or you're doing that and they're doing something for you. And that way you can get the livestock into the tank sooner. But it's hard to make all the corals happy. And you have to kind of go in knowing you're not going to, not everything's going to survive. Just, that's the reality of the situation. You're taking them out of their perfect ecosystem, you're changing everything in their life, and you're trying to set up a new ecosystem quickly. It's really hard. And to expect the corals to like just adapt to new flow, different water, different neighbors, uh, manhandling, putty and glue, uh, you know, just the toxins from the glue in the PVC pipe that you just put together, uh, the temperature change because you didn't quite get it right or it cooled down quite a bit and now you're warming them up again. I mean, there's so many things that can go wrong and it's really, really hard to anticipate every one of those variables and not let them happen. So uh, keeping your livestock safe is ideal. And there are certain things you can do. Like if you're, for example, you're going to bring frags to a frag swap and you want to sell corals, these guys have it down to a science. I watched this one guy at one frag swap. He set up his tank. He put the light over the top. He poured the water in. He opened the lid of his cooler. He took the tray out with all the frags and put it in the tank. He says, I'm ready. And I was like, that was amazing. And like everyone else is still working on, you know, connecting pipes and stuff. And he said, when does this thing start? And I said, it starts at 10. And he said, why am I here so early? Because, I mean, his water is crystal clear and his corals are already starting to open up. <laughs> it was amazing. And he had, you know, it was literally, I mean, it had to have been his hundredth time doing this because he was so slick. And when you're trying to move corals from one place to another, even if you have giant coolers full of salt water and you've got everything isolated from each other or you put plastic between them so they can't touch each other, just the shifting as you're carrying the containers, they can smash against each other and break pieces off, which cause stress in the corals. Like I said, the water will be cooling off. You might put in a power head to create some circulation, but it's blowing the stress and the slime off one coral and landing on the next coral, or the water is getting a little bit chemically altered by the, chem the, the corals exuding stuff. I mean, there's so much that can happen. It's just hard. So you just have to kind of think your way through and maybe... You know, I mean, okay, so perfect circumstance would be you're setting up a new tank in the new location for a full month before you take the old tank down. That would be really nice. So if you said, look, we're moving out of this apartment, we're buying a house. I would stay with the apartment one extra month. <laughs> and that way you could deal with moving out of the apartment and getting stuff in the house. You can have the new tank set up, hopefully, and let it go through whatever it's going through. And then the day you want to move the corals, the tank's ready. And you basically just have to acclimate and get them in there. And you had 29 days to do whatever, you know? And you're paying that one extra month of rent, but it would be a lot less stressful for you because you're not sitting there racing the clock trying to get from point A to point B with one tank into the other one. Now, if you're trying to move this tank from this home to that home, there is no 30-day thing. Um, but like my son, he just recently moved out of one place into another and they kept the rent going so they could move everything out over that over a period of weeks and they had time to clean it so they could get their deposit back. So, I mean, there is some benefit to not trying to be out by the 30th and in by the 1st. 
and trying to move everything you own and an aquarium with all the livestock involved. Okay. Maria, I like what you said here. She said, this has become my new Saturday afternoon uh, watch. I'm watching Mark doing my water change and learning a few new things. Thanks. Oh, good. Calypso says, from the tips from last week's live stream, their skimmer is now working great. Like a beast! That's how they're supposed to run. And Macy's daddy says, the live stream means that I'm able to test the water and do some maintenance. Yep. Okay, um, Alex says, is it okay to go without mechanical filtration? I don't want to clean filter socks. Alex, you're kind of asking about a couple of things. Can a tank have zero filtration and still live? No, something has to happen. Whether you're changing the water or you are running a protein skimmer or you are changing filter socks, I mean, there's something has to remove some waste from the water. If you don't like cleaning filter socks, welcome to the club, none of us do. Many of us don't even have filter socks. We just siphon out the junk out of the sump as it builds up over time. And so every two or three months, we vacuum it all out, and now we have a nice clean sump again. Uh, if you want to have filter socks, there's a couple reasons people use them. One is to trap the waste, okay? Uh, the second thing that people use filter socks for is to get rid of microbubbles. So the water draining down into your sump is full of air and water, and it makes these bubbles, and the bubbles go through the sump, and the return pump sucks in those bubbles and pushes the bubbles in the tank. And when you look in your display tank, there's bubbles everywhere. They might be really fine, they may be a few hundred, they may be a few thousand, but they're irritating. They just don't look right. It doesn't seem right. And when they visit people's systems, they're like, wow, their water's crystal clear. How'd you do that? Well, maybe they did it because they had filter socks to catch the water and hold the bubbles inside the sock, and only what comes out of the, the mesh of the fabric is pure water with no bubbles. Um, so that is one thing. So if you got rid of your socks, you may be running to a challenge of microbubbles. Now, I don't run filter socks at all. I never have. I try never to. I mean, it's like three or four times a year I actually hook up a big filter sock for a big deep cleaning. And when all of my filter socks are dirty, once a year I clean them because <laughs> I have four. And so that's my thing. But I have some detritus around the protein skimmer on the bottom of the sump and maybe some in the return zone. And so every few months I vacuum out that little bit of waste. But I have a big, huge protein skimmer, I have a refugium, I have a bunch of live rock, I have a lot of natural and mechanical filtration going on. The socks are just one piece of the filtration. And then the water changes are going to be very, really important because they're a way to remove nitrate from the water and uh, it helps remove phosphate and other things. And of course it introduces a lot of trace elements that come in the new salt mix. So uh, I'm kind of one of the guys that only changes water occasionally. I'm not a big proponent of it myself. But the less filtration you actually have in place, the more the water changes are critically important to do. Oh, I just thought of something else I want to mention. Well, I kind of, I thought it, but I didn't say it out loud. <laughs> so when you're, uh, check the battery here. When you're, um, setting up the tank and I told you to pull it a few inches away from the wall. The other benefit of not having the tank next to the wall is that the salt spatter and creep and things that happen when you're working in the tank don't hit the wall and destroy the sheetrock behind the aquarium. So keep that one in mind as well. We're trying to protect the house that the tank is in so it doesn't get wrecked. And so there's a benefit to having that tank away from the wall. Um, Sandy has had a rough month. Last month, I had the flooring done, so the house, of course, was naturally completely uprooted and upside down, moving everything out of the way. The tank got neglected. I lost five fish. I have an aptasia explosion. Then the tank overheated, and the alkalinity dropped. I am so sorry to hear all that happen, Cindy. When, and you know what? That's another reason why you have to move a tank. You're getting the floors replaced. Or you're getting the carpet replaced. And so these things have to be done. You have to move the aquarium somewhere. So let's talk about one more part of moving an aquarium. <laughs> See, I told you your questions might give you more information. Let's say you have a small tank. Um, I've got one right here next to me. Okay, I just built this for our customer. Um, this tank here is 50 gallons, basically. And I'll give you guys a close-up in a little bit. So this tank here could be moved with two people. But let's say there's a bunch of sand under inside of it so it's heavy. And, you, and let's say it's made of glass instead of acrylic. 
and you don't want the bottom to break. What can you do to safely carry this from one room to the next? Well, you would drain out as much water as possible, and then what I would recommend you do is slide a piece of plywood underneath it that's about the size of the aquarium, maybe slightly larger. And then you put your hands under the plywood and you can pick up your tank and you can walk it into another room and you can set it down on something. Now, I would probably set it down on top of a couple of two by fours so that way you can still get your fingers underneath and lift it up again when it's time to ring back in the room. But if you put the plywood underneath like an all-in-one tank, like a bio cube that's, you know, 29 gallon or there's a 15 gallon or whatever, you're supporting it so the bottom of the tank doesn't break and drop, you know, and just, you know, break. You, you don't want the tank to break, right? We don't want to burst a seam. We don't want to rack the tank. Now, if the tank is pretty heavy, if there's a lot of sand, it might be best to scoop the sand out. Um, if you're moving the tank out of the room and you're kind of doing this breakdown and reset, it might be worth just taking it outside clean it really really well remove all the substrate and then put in brand new clean sand and maybe a bag of live sand for the bacteria and put that in the tank that's been cleaned and then when the floor is all done you know the, the hardwood floor is installed or the new carpets in place you put the tank in place with a brand new you know sand bed that'd be really awesome and you can bring the tank in and see you didn't carry out a really heavy tank and crack it because you removed all the sand or the gravel or whatever you had in the bottom so that's one of the things that I would recommend when you're moving a small tank is get someone to help you and support the base of the tank. It's super important. Um, uh, Pickle Boy says, what are good beginner corals? Uh, softies are usually the best beginner corals. So leathers, zoanthids, star polyps, um, mushrooms. <laughs> All these things are in the soft family. These are all in my Critter ID section, my website. You can go to the softy section. You can look at all these things and see what is appealing to you and see if you want to put that in your aquarium. Just know that most any softy you get will grow quickly. Uh, it will get kind of large and it can take up a lot of take over a lot of area in your tank. And then later when you want something that's a little bit more challenging, you may have nowhere to put it. Softies uh, are nice, but they uh, can be effusive. And in that scenario, you may regret adding certain corals to your tank later on and wish you'd never done it. So I'm saying if you like that or if you love that and you want simple, go with it and don't let anyone talk you out of it. But there's others say, why would you ever recommend that type of coral to anyone? Yeah, well, I mean, there are people out there that like certain things. So if they want something easy, that's easy. If you want something more challenging, I would say stay away from softies, but it will be harder and you'll have to know more and you'll have to maintain better water quality because those other corals are more demanding. Oh, see? All right. So Thomas said, I had to move a 90 gallon and a 50 gallon from New Jersey to the Gulf Coast. The 50 tall didn't even make it on the truck. The 90 African cichlid became salt and that's how I became <laughs> just a saltwater tank. Yep, I mean, just during the move, the tank can be broken. And that has happened to so many people. They go through all this preparation, and then their helper drops one end. Uh, the tank might even be slippery. Another thing to know when you're moving a tank. <laughs> it's so funny. As you guys say things, it makes me think of other things. So the tank itself, it's used, right? It's had salt water in it. That salt on the surface makes it a little slippery. And especially when you're picking it up. It's been sitting in place for a long time. You reach under... And you can feel with your fingertips, it's a little slippery. It's really hard to clean the underside of the tank you're about to move. You know, asking someone, hey, do you have some Windex? Unlikely. You can wipe it down with a wet towel to kind of get some of the basically salt creep. I mean, it's really what it is. It's just a little bit of a salty film that makes it feel a little slippery. And if you can remove as much of that as possible, that would be helpful. But you need to talk with the person that's moving with you. Are you okay? Are you okay? Are you okay? <laughs> I know that sounds annoying, but at the same time, you know if they're not. They can say, oh, no, i got to put it down. Okay, let's put it down. I'll put it down. I'll put it down. You know, that way it doesn't get broken. Um, if they're like, oh, I got it, and then you just keep walking, and then they don't got it, then you don't got a tank. So we want to make sure that it's clean. Suction cups are really good, and those big suction cups have a plunger on the side. And you tap, 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 and it, it grabs on the glass. can be beneficial, but the tank has to be clean where the suction cup goes. And if you didn't clean it first, the suction cup can pop off. Uh, one guy was moving his tank, and he had like a film on the back. It was like that blue background, and part of it had come off. 
And what he did, and I didn't see it, or I would have warned him, because I was on the other side waiting for the tank to be pushed up into place, he put the suction cup half on the glass and half on that film, and everyone's lifting, and his suction cup came off and just hit him in the mouth. So, and I know why, because it was on an uneven surface. He wasn't just only on glass. He was partially on that weird background that was peeling off, and it just let go. So, you want to make sure the surface is clean, smooth, nothing on it, put the suction cup on, get a good tug, make sure it's good to go, check all the other suction cups, and then your group lift. And I tend to believe that one suction cup equals two people. So that's really nice because it gives you a good grip when it comes to carrying it. But you may get into narrow hallways as you're trying to go out. You might have to remove some suction cups and just have them on the ends to get through the hallway. And as soon as you're in the open area, put the suction cups back on and get more people involved. Don't just expect those two guys that are on each end to handle the whole load now. That's just a very temporary moment. Uh, Maria, thank you very much for the super chat. I appreciate that. Let's see. <laughs> she said it's for banana for Spock. You are so sweet. Thank you so much. I'll get her some banana. Uh, Jesse says, what are your thoughts on a Tomini or a Cole Tang for a four foot long aquarium that's 73 gallons? Uh, well, the Cole is the smaller tang so that could be okay and it is a working tang but i guess i would try to get a very small one so you can enjoy it and then keep in the back of your mind you will be upgrading to a bigger tank at some point for that fish i think that's the best way to handle it uh, rather than saying you can't have it you know just think ahead i think that'd be best And Slade, thank you very much for the super chat. I appreciate that. Uh, Howard says, how is Spock doing? I seem to recall she had some problems. Uh, she has a problem with her eye, and it has not been corrected. Let me see if I can switch that one light on and off so we can get some blue. Because it just looks like it's on fire. Okay. Wait a minute, and I'll turn it back on. Carlos says, must have saltwater aquarium books. Uh, the Conscientious Marine Aquarist, Aquarist by Bob Fenner is a really good one. Um, Reef Aquarium Volume 1 and Volume 3 are my favorites from Julian Sprung and Charles Delbeck. That's another uh, good pair of books. Uh, between those three, I think you'd be completely covered for a long time. Then there is a book specifically just on corals by Eric Borneman that's really good. And uh, Coral Magazine, be a subscriber. That issue comes out every two months. I even sell the Coral Magazine on my website. I have the latest issue in stock, and I haven't put it on the website yet. I will try to get that done today. Um, Coral Magazine is a, month, like I said, it, it's, it's a subscription, and it'll come in the mail. You can get the digital copy, but I prefer the printed one that I can hold in my hands and open and flip through the pictures. And the cool thing for me is as I read the different articles, a lot of the people writing are people I know. So it's even more of a connection. I really get to enjoy that. Let me turn this light back on now, like I said I would. All right. So that'll look a little bit better. Oh, my God. I think I'm reading this right. Hang on. Yeah, Aquatic Fool says, <laughs> I recently bought a house and I'm going to be moving 17 tanks to a reef. One is a frag system, and would you recommend bagging all corals individually or buckets or leaving them on the rocks? It's kind of a challenge. Uh, whatever you can put in a bag with some water and you know tie it off to protect it would be smart because it'll be less likely to be crushed. But the ones that are like on a rock that are really holding on that just don't want to let go, you could orient them in bins for the move and like face them up but it's it's going to be challenging because if anything topples it's going to smash into another one so you may have like a some kind of a igloo cooler or buckets or trash cans or whatever and you have some of the regular rock in the bottom and then you put the ones with corals on the very top and you make sure it's all covered in water and then one person grabs each end of the trash can and you walk it out like crabs to the truck you know two people carrying that trash can full of water and rock and coral would be hard but not impossible but 17 tanks? Are you kidding me? 
Isn't it time to downsize down to one awesome reef? That would be my recommendation. Uh, Aquatic Fool says, how much water, in percentage-wise, should I keep and add back to the new, uh, new, you know, the new tank in the new place? Uh, don't know about a percent. I tip, I mean, like I said, when I moved the 280, we brought all the water over, so we made sure we had enough. I didn't use it all. Um, typically, the water you're bringing isn't as clean as your new water, but at the same time, the livestock's used to it, so I want to bring, I, I would say, maybe 50% of the used water if it's clean enough to see through. It's something you could do if it's not that great. You could put a filter sock or two filter socks inside each other and pump the water through the sock so whatever's in that barrel you're hauling in uh, or jugs or whatever, if it's kind of murky, it catches a lot of the sediment and you have cleaner water uh, in the new setup. You know, So you could do that to kind of catch some particulates and hopefully uh, do that and then dilute it with some nice clean new salt water. Uh, Mr. Reef Buster says, can you show us the power strips with individual switches and advise where to get one? Those are called the American DJ Power Strips, and they'll be available on Amazon. They will be on, um, uh, they're at Guitar Center if you want to buy them locally. And there's different styles. Let me do this. Power, what did I call it? Power Center? Let me live. So I'll show you what they look like. Huh. <laughs> Wow, this is an old one. All right, so I'll show you this. Can you still hear me? Yeah, Mike's still. So right here in the center, <clears throat> these were a bunch of X, uh, X10 modules, but right here he's talking about the American DJs. So these have eight switches on the front with eight outlets on the back, and then there's a 15 amp little circuit button here that you would press in, and those things are how I would be able to turn things on and off. So I could literally flip a switch and turn off the protein skimmer instead of having to find the cord and unplug it. And then I use all these X10 modules to trigger things on and off remotely. But, uh, and there you can see all my cords. So what you're seeing here, all these plugs went to the back of those DJ switches, right here, and each of them went to one of these outlets. That's why I had so many outlets in my panel. I made this a long time ago. And I had someone helping me make this, and he did some of the wires backwards. I was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> I had to go through and double check all his work. That happened. Uh, so yeah, you can use those. I love them. I think they're great. The only trick is how to connect them. They're a little bit difficult to screw into place. All right. Okay, uh, Rob Pinkman did a post talking about how he's got well water and his DI resin was being destroyed. And I told him at the time, I can't explain this to you on my phone. <laughs> so he got me on the live stream, so I'm gonna answer that now. The well water you have seems to be destroying your DI resin because of the CO2 in the water. And this happens to some people that have well water. A lot of people don't have to deal with this, but some do, it's unfortunate. So you have an RO system and you said the water coming out of the RO was three TDS, and it went into the DI, but within 90 gallons, the DI was destroyed, which is terrible. I mean, that's really bad. Uh, with three TDS, you should be getting a much higher number, like, I don't know, I'm just ballparking here, and I might be way off, but you should be getting about 800 gallons off of that cartridge of DI resin. So you want to off-gas the CO2. Now, the way you do this, it's going to take a little bit of effort on your part. So you're going to take your RO water, just like you normally do, and it's going to go into a barrel. Just a big barrel uh, with a big PVC pipe that is sitting in the barrel at an angle. So you've got your barrel of water, you've got your pipe sitting in that PVC pipe, and then you're going to take an air stone, like a wooden air stone or a ceramic air stone because it's heavy, and you have airline tubing going to an air pump, and you snake it down the PVC pipe. And that will oxygenate the water in the pipe itself. It's not oxygenating the barrel. You're oxygenating the water in the pipe. And then you're going to take more tubing, and you could put it through some kind of a pump. Maybe a permeate pump is what one guy used. Maybe a dosing pump. Uh, and you would take the water that's oxygenated and send it into the DI, and then the DI goes into another barrel, and your DI resin will last a lot longer. So that is how you overcome the CO2 problem. 
And uh, I feel like at some point somewhere, someone did a, a write-up about this, but that's the principle behind it. And I, I think that if you did that, if you have the room for a second barrel, you would be able to do this and find your DI is going to last you a lot longer. Uh, hopefully that helps. Uh, Tim says, are you open to using bio pellets again? I'm trying Tropic Marin's NP Bacto pellets with very nice results. They differ from the regular bio pellets with marine polymer from seaweed. Uh, the last bio pellets I used that I liked were from Reef Octo. Um, there were the biospheres. And I'm not really looking to add another reactor of bio pellets this time. I checked my nitrate just a, a few days ago, and it was, I think it was a week ago, and it was 30. So my numbers have not gone up. And I just talked with my friend last night about helping me siphon the perimeter of the sand bed in my reef and move corals out of the way and just work away across and make sure that the tube doesn't come out of the barrel while I'm working in the tank. And just having a second person do that, I think I'll remove, because the tank is about to turn seven years old. And I want to just kind of hit that sand bed. And I've got a ton of salt water to use right now, so I could do a big giant water change again and probably bring them all the way down to about 15 and have them stay down nice and low. So that would be so I don't really see the need for bio pellets. I definitely need to take the turf scrubber and remove the tray. I've ignored it for a solid month, and I need to do a little cleaning in my refugium, but I've been doing some more maintenance on the tank uh, in the last week, trying to get little things caught up that are being neglected to keep the tank happy. Uh, Maria says, I've been finally adding corals. Can you place them directly on the sand bed or keep them up on the rock work because I have a couple of very OCD hermit crabs that don't like change. That's funny. Um, I, whenever I get new corals, I always put them down on the sand bed so I can get my hands off of them as soon as possible. So I get that brand new coral. I like it. It's pretty. I spend the money. I bring it home. I acclimate it. I dip it in something to make sure there's no pests on it. I inspect it visually to see that there's nothing on there that looks like it doesn't belong. And then I put it down in the sand and ignore it for a couple of weeks because Anything else I'm doing is just more stress on that new coral. And I want that coral to calm down and realize all is well. It's going to be okay. <laughs> and then after a couple of weeks, then I can place it where I need it. And, you know, even if it falls over, I tend to ignore it. But you could reach in and stand it back up or use some tongs and kind of grab the frag plug and stand it up. Uh, you could put it in some kind of a frag tray rack thing if you wanted, if you're more worried about it staying upright. But usually the plug is enough I can just jam it on the sand and just kind of It'll be okay for a little while. Now, about these OCD hermits you have, I don't know what to tell you. You may just have to uh, see what they do because technically it's their house and you're just uh, providing electricity and water. Uh, Francis says, any tips on gluing PVC pipe to acrylic? Yeah, actually, there is a way to do that. Uh, like the side of protein skimmers may have a PVC pipe sitting on the side and it seems to be glued on. The uh, PVC cement does that job. Um, the one I use, it's in a red can. So it's Odie's and it, um, it's, this stuff is all purpose and it works really well. It's kind of a creamy color. I don't know if you can see that. It's kind of that cream color and you just put it on the end of the fitting and then you press it up against the acrylic and it will bond on. And if something comes loose, you can use this to reconnect it on. And that works. Now, there's a chance the acrylic may craze and get little tiny micro cracks. Can't do anything about that. But that is uh, something I've done when needed from time to time. What are you trying to accomplish? What are you building? Uh, Scratchy Chan says, do you think your algae turf scrubber is working? I definitely think it is. There's a lot of grossness in there. <laughs> it's really hideous. Uh, and plus, my refusion is looking a little weaker. But I've been ignoring it. I just feel like I need to get in there. But it does. It looks thinned out. It looks like there's less happy plants in there, which was something I was kind of expecting the turf scrubber to do. So we'll see. Hmm. I'm not sure I understand this question, Chris. He said, any advice on testing for water tightness after a move? We moved from the UK to Spain a while ago, and I'm finally I'm ready to fill it again. This is... Maybe you're talking about the strength of the aquarium, like to make sure the tank is okay to hold water. Is that what you're asking? Um, yeah. He said that the silicone is still supple. 
that is usually the key with an aquarium to know if the seams are going to be okay. If it feels hard as a as stone, it's probably going to give. But if it feels like you can press your fingernail into it and it you know it feels soft and gives a little bit, that's usually okay. Um, you could put the tank outside and test it with water and wait a couple of days and see how it does. Um, the one thing that terrifies me, I see people do from time to time, is they'll take their aquarium and they'll set it on sawhorses. And a sawhorse is an inch and a half wide, you know, by the depth, right? And they set the tank on it. So you got two skinny rails, got this full-on aquarium, and they fill it with water. For some reason, they want to fill it up in the air. And uh, I just, I think it's a terrible way to test a tank. I always fully support something. If it was this tank, I would put a sheet of foam on the ground outside. I'd set this tank on the foam and I'd put water in it and fill it to the brim and I would let it sit for a day or two and watch and see what it does. But I always fully support a tank. So if you are trying to test an aquarium, I would set it on a very smooth surface or I'd put a sheet of foam down first to protect the bottom of the tank, put the tank on it and I would fill it up with water and check it. Um, the Musical Reef says, I keep having the male clownfish die once I add them. My tank is a 45 gallon, it's filled with happy SPS, and the female seems docile and doesn't attack them, so what is causing this? Okay, number one, you said the male. The general rule of thumb is the biggest clownfish in the tank will always be the female. And the next size down will be the male. Now when you introduce a clownfish to a, an existing system with a clown that's already in there, it should be half the size of the one that lives. So you've got this clown in your tank, let's say it's a two inch clownfish, you want a one inch mate. And uh, preferably the same type of clownfish. I know people love to have, well I want a bullet hole and I want a snowflake, you know, and they want them to get along. Uh, it would be much better if they are the same Ocellaris, for example, or they're both uh, Truperculas or something like that. Uh, maybe you're trying to put this type of clownfish with a cinnamon clown, I don't know. You said you're not seeing kind of attacking, so maybe there, it, there's no problem at all. But maybe there is some squabbling going on when you're not looking when you leave the room. Maybe they're being sneaky about it. So keep that in mind. Um, hey, MetroCat is in here. This is the perfect time for me to transition into a quick sales pitch. So this right here is called Reef Suds, and it is a soap that is made to wash your hands before you're reaching your aquarium. So here is this really pretty soap. It has no smell. It has no chemicals in it. It has no uh, uh, fragrances. It is just soap. <laughs> and you can use it to clean your hands because, you know, we, especially nowadays, everyone's wearing masks and using sanitizer on their hands. And we have to clean our hands and then we put our hands in our aquarium. Is there a risk to the reef? So I would highly recommend that you always wash your hands first. And this is something that MetroCat is selling. <laughs> so she has a whole bunch of these and she wants you to have them so she doesn't have them all. And these are $7.50 a bar for this size. They have, she has a smaller sample and there's like a flat rate shipping. So, you know, like it can be shipped for $5, which is about right. That's, you know, I know about shipping because I ship all the time. If you got two or three, you're gonna get better money because of shipping. So I would recommend that. And you would just reach out to MetroCat. And she's at MetroCat on all social media. Or it's probably MetroCat at gmail.com or something along those lines. <laughs> Maybe she'll uh, update us here. I know she told it to me before, but now I'm not on that window, so I can't look. But anyway, um, it's a really cool option to have. And uh, I'm going to help her unload these. There is an article about this if you want to know more details. You can look up Reef Suds on ReefBuilders.com. They did a full write-up. This came out many years ago. It's been around since 2013. It's not something brand new. And a stash of it was found. A Metro Cat said, I will get those into the hands of people. So if you were wanting to try out some reef suds, Metro Cat is the person to talk to. So this is Metro Cat. There she is. See her avatar? She's smiling. So buy her soap. All right. Um, I want to talk to you guys about this tank I built. I'm going to take a quick transition here. I'm going to hold the camera. It's going to be very bouncy. I apologize for that. So this tank here is 49 gallons. It's made of 3 8 cast acrylic. It's nice and strong. It is 20 inches across. 
24 inches front to back, or what I call deep, and then 21 inches tall. It has a three quarter inch return there, and it has a one inch drain over here. And this is for my friend Tammy. I made her this special lid. It's got holes in here for breathing because I was worried that her fish might need some air. And then she asked for a feeding hole. So I made her a one inch hole to drop food in. And it is recessed right in there so you can see it's smooth, it's nice. And then I put a notch back here in the event she wanted to put in like a heater or something that needed a power cord, maybe a small power head of some kind. And so this is her new tank. She's getting it on Monday. And I just wanted to show it to you all. And um, it's going to go adjacent to the sump that I made her recently. And I said, well, what's the point of this? What are you going to do with it? And she said that that is going to be her timeout tank for if she has any fish that are misbehaving. So she'll take them out of her big tank and she'll put them in here. And then they will behave. And then when she puts them back up in the tank, they um, should be good citizens again. So I made that for her. And she's picking it up so I don't have to ship it, which is good. Um, I do a lot of custom acrylic work. I have uh, a few sumps going out next week to customers. I've been waiting patiently while life was inter inter interfering with business. So um, I've also been trying to be better about answering my emails. I know some of you have been trying to reach out to get a hold of me and said, you know, why are you so difficult to reach? I'm sorry. It's been one of me and a lot of stuff going on, and I apologize, and I'm trying to be better. <laughs> so... Um, I do want to, I guess I'll throw this on here. I do appreciate it when you guys do buy things from Vila's Reef. So please shop there. And this website's been around a long time. And I sell all kinds of aquarium supplies that will help your life be easier. It's the same things I use myself. And that's why I sell them, because I believe in them. And I make a lot of acrylic things, too. So, uh, you know, anything you buy from the site, you know, helps pay the bills. And also, if shipping seems high, if I can ship it for less, I will be refunding you the difference because I'm not trying to take advantage of you when it comes to shipping. I just want to say that out loud. One day I'll have a better uh, shipping module that will figure things out more accurately and you won't have to uh, see big numbers. <laughs> and it'll be more reasonable. But, you know, that's where we are now on what's going on there. All right, back to the questions. Uh, M. Wilk, who's a DFW Mass member, club member of mine, said we moved from an apartment in Grapevine to Fort Worth. That's about a 45 minute drive. Uh, he said we moved in early April and it was 93 degrees out that day that we moved. I lost two fish. It's not the local fish store's fault, it's just the hazards of moving. Yeah, moving's just tricky and it's going to be really hard to do it successfully. Joe says, if you remember last week, I was having issues getting gold maroons into a ritteri. I bought a bubble tip anemone just to see what would happen, and they went into it in 10 minutes flat. Should I take the ritteri back? Yes, I would. Uh, Steve P says, have you ever had a situation where every time you use Optasia X to kill Optasia, it causes them to spread instead of killing it? No, not necessarily spread, but it doesn't seem to eliminate it forever. Um, you might try f -Aptasia. It seems to be a little bit more effective. It is available in my uh, shop, and uh, a lot of people really like it. So f is from Frank's Tanks, and I sell it in a large bottle so you have plenty, and you completely coat it with like a hard crust, and then a few days later you break the crust off and there's no f there anymore. Oh, wow. Michael says, my tank exploded the bottom seam of my Red Sea Reefer not long ago. And I had to quickly put all my livestock in the bathtub while I had to wait for the delivery on the new tank. <laughs> wow. That's a great idea. Oh, cool. So I might be able to fix my energy bar. Reefkeeper says they fixed, he fixed his for $75. Jay said it cost 120 bucks to do it. So, I mean, you know. I just like to fix it. Yeah, but he, Jay's like, you can just get a new one for 159. I mean, you're not wrong. Actually, now they're 179, but I know what you're saying. I just hate it when I have a dead outlet or a live outlet. <laughs> I want to control it. Let's see. Um... Okay, Tim says, I have an acrofrag that turned white. Now it's turned brown. 
I can't tell if the polyps are really there. The original color was dark blue with neon polyps. Could it be coming back? It could be turning brown because it's just getting dirty. It's growing algae. There's no life. That is a possibility. You need to see it. Maybe get one of those magnifying glass things that you can really view the coral in your tank or pick up the rock and bring it closer to you or something. But you need to know if it's live or if it's a dead skeleton. Because a dead skeleton can't just turn brown. It can turn white. It can you know grow algae. But uh, I know it's only been a few weeks, but if you see no trace of life, it may be a goner. It's a bummer that happened to you. Oof. Dennis uh, said that he had a 400 gallon tank that moved itself two inches from the wall during a 5.5 earthquake. Yeah, I guess we could talk about earthquakes for a moment <laughs> in Croatia. The tank survived, but there was structural damage to the house, so the tank had to be shut down for four months while they rebuilt everything. Um, if you're in an area where there is a earth, you know, where you're prone to earthquakes, it's really good to secure the stand to the wall with some kind of a tether, some kind of a strap, something that is bolted into the stud of the house so that the entire tank can't dance across the floor. So as the house is shaking, the stand stays with the wall and hopefully the tank stays on the stand. But if you don't secure that stand to the wall with something, that the stand rocking can just throw the tank off and you could lose it. Uh, I've only had tanks while I was here in Texas and so I don't have to worry about earthquakes at all. So you definitely want to keep that in mind. Um... Thank you, Christine. Andrea. Andrea, Christine. Oh, you and your two first names. Okay, here's another story. <laughs> Tam Hodge says, I'm planning on moving south in a few years, and I'm planning on asking the local coral store to hold my livestock while I move and get my tank set up again. Hopefully they'll agree and ship it. All right, so let me tell you a story about a friend of mine who moved from... I think Chicago, no, Detroit. He moved from Detroit to Dallas-Fort Worth, and he shipped his corals to a fish store here in the Metroplex and said, please take care of my corals and fish while I'm setting up my new tank. And once the tank is established and ready, I will pick up my livestock. And that's exactly what Tam said that she wanted to do. Well, what ended up happening was employees were selling his corals and fish to customers rather than saying, no, we're holding this for a customer. None of this is for sale. And other stuff that they were taking care of, they weren't taking care of well enough and died. So he lost corals, he lost fish, and they sold some of his stuff. And he was really mad. So you need to have a great relationship with your fish store you're trying to do this with and be crystal clear if I give you 10 corals and 5 fish, I expect to receive 10 corals and 5 fish, barring any real bad news that happened in the fish store. You know, that's beyond your control. Um, that's the hard part. So keep that in mind. Uh, it happened to him. He was very upset. He eventually just put it behind him because what else could he do? Uh, Hands of Stone says, what does it truly mean for a tank to mature? Please watch my live stream on tank maturity. I did it about a month or two ago, and it's a really good topic. So just watch that. Uh, Life of Joel says, any advice for someone looking to rejoin the hobby after a four-year break? Four years isn't that long ago. Uh, most of what you knew then probably still applies now. There hasn't been any massive strides forward other than a little bit more automation. We're using more dosing pumps than ever. Uh, we're using automatic testers now, which is nice. But other than that, the things you knew back then still apply, and you should be okay. Uh, Tim says, are you happy with the Clarisy performance? Is it worth it? Uh, it's doing just fine. It's not using very much fleece, which means that my drains are barely sending any water into the the uh, fleece roller. But uh, yeah, no, it's worked just fine. I just, at some point, have to force myself to do a video. <laughs> But yeah, and I'm happy with it. And I think uh, there's people setting up tanks with like one or two of those to filter all their water coming into the tank. The one thing you have to keep in mind with the Clarisy and probably with any fleece roller 
is how many gallons per hour you can push through that device. Because a lot of people say, well, I've got this giant pump and it can move this much water, but the fleece can't handle it. <clears throat> so it's got to be something can handle the amount of water going through the pipe. And for example, I have the large clarity, and the water pipe going into it is one inch. So how much water can move through a one inch pipe? Um, and that's where you, so you're looking at maybe 600 gallons an hour going through there, 800 gallons an hour. So if you were running two of them, you're pushing it up to about 1600 gallons. But is that enough or is that, uh, are you moving more flow than that? So keep that in mind. Uh, Glenn says, I have a question with dosing coral food. Is it a no-no if you add coral powder with amino acids in the same small container with the water? Or will the amino acids destroy the coral powder? No, they shouldn't. Uh, the amino acids, the point behind them is typically to create a, a feeding response in the corals. So rather than mixing them together, it might be better to put the amino acids in the tank first and then 10, 15 minutes later put the coral food in. That might be a better approach. But... Uh, I think if you combine them together, it probably could be okay. When you're feeding corals, I would recommend you turn off the return pump so that the food you're pouring in to feed the corals stays with the corals. It doesn't go down the drain and into the skimmer, into a sock, into anything. It just gets absorbed by the corals. And then after, I don't know, 15 minutes or so, 30 minutes, you could restart your return pump. Alex says, so I finally realized why people say it's so hard to keep a mixed reef. My SPS hate the dirty water and my Ganyapura garden doesn't like it too clean. Do you have any tips? Uh, feed really well, stay on top of maintenance, clean your water. <laughs> Which takes you right back to your earlier question about hating to clean filter socks. Because your filter socks are catching a lot of the food you're dumping in for the Ganyapura uh, garden and you're losing, you're wasting food. So whenever you feed your corals in the tank, you would stop, like I was just telling Glenn, turn off your return pump so the food stays in the tank for 15 minutes or so. Then turn on your return pump, and then whatever food still has to be in the water would be caught in the socks, trapped in the protein skimmer, and exported. But yeah, it is. It's hard. Uh, a mixed reef is not an easy thing to do. I've been doing it for, I don't know, 16 years, and I, I'm not pushing it. I'm also not expecting miracles. I don't expect to have the best-looking SPS and... I, cause you know, there's guys out there that have just corals. I was like, Oh my God, they look photoshopped. They're so amazing. Mine are pretty. I like them, but they don't look like the photographs. And that's because they are running a 100% SPS reef with nothing else in there. And so they have the best of the best and, you know, and then they're doing these crazy concoctions trying to, uh, more scientifically manipulate the water to get these exotic colorations that are just eye popping. It's just mind blowing stuff. But my tank has LPS, SPS, leathers, um, chalices, uh, fungias. I mean, I have all kinds of stuff. And I love all the stuff I have in my tank. And some things do really well and some things grow slower. But they all keep living. That's what matters. All right. Thanks, Thomas. Sorry. Uh, thanks for the correction. Uh, Marcus says the joists in my crawl space run the same way as my tank that's sitting above. I know it should be the other way. Should I cut out boards to put between the joists and put cross braces? You could put cross braces or you could just put a couple of piers under there to kind of reinforce the front joist because the back joist isn't going to do anything. Or you could do something that supports the entire area the tank is under. So whatever your size tank is, just support that much area under the floor across a couple of joists. You could do that might be better than just tr putting cross braces because even if you did put cross braces, which is nice, the, the long joists are still going to sag down in the center from the weight of the tank. So I would support underneath however you have to do it. Uh, Marcus Aurelius says, do you know anyone that makes a good 120 volt inline pump? Inline. Uh, it seems like it's been discontinued. 
Well, um, I don't know what Siche has, but I know Cobalt has an inline pump. Um, it depends what you're trying to accomplish and what size pump. I mean, typically inline is almost like closed loop. So you have, I'm, you know, I just don't know exactly what you're trying to accomplish, but I'm thinking in my brain, Eheim, Vectra, um, what's that one? Ah, oh, can almost think of it. I know what the pump looks like too. Uh, they were really proud of their pumps at Macna, and they were very proud that they were not DC. <laughs> that was their big selling pitch. They are not DC. I'm like, okay, well, we've had AC pumps forever. And it's like, these are AC. And I was like, all right. I can't think of the name right now. It's like Desmond or something like that. And uh, those pumps, you know, but yeah, if you're trying to get the Cobalt one, that, I don't know what's going on with Cobalt. I need to reach out to them and see what's up. The, uh, that was a very small inline pump that was practical for doing some work. But uh, there's other stuff you can use instead. Um, Timothy has a six gallon Pico reef impacted with green hair algae. It's less than three months old. I keep plucking it, but to no avail. Uh, nitrate is under control. I'm doing active water changes. Should I go dark for a few days? Well, I don't know what livestock is in your six gallon aquarium, but it's a very small tank. So maybe you are lacking the cleanup crew to eat this algae. And you know, it's a six gallon tank, so you need six critters. And I would put those in there. So I would pluck off what you can, and I would do a water change. And then I would get my cleanup crew in there to start snacking on the algae. Hermit crabs as well as snails are needed. And uh, I would try that and see what happens next. Just another face in the crowd says, I have a concrete floor. Can I put a 2,000 liter in the room without having to reinforce the floor? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe. You didn't say if it was the foundation or if it was a concrete floor like on the 14th floor of an apartment complex. But um, 2,000 liters seems big. That's somewhere around 500 gallons, right? If it's on the first floor, it's probably going to be fine. I'm looking for, you know what, I'm going to put on a video in the background because you guys have been looking at me too long. So I'll do that. Put me up here and I'm going to look for the next question. Uh, Dave Zhang says, is it better to sell off all the livestock before moving a tank? Seems people try moving the whole tank and the livestock and they lose like 50% due to the stress of the moving. That's what I was saying. Sometimes it just doesn't work out. It would be less stressful to have zero livestock. That way you can just take your equipment, you can clean it really well, you can set up the new tank, you can make any changes you want to do, and then you can introduce new livestock. That is definitely an option. Just some of us are really attached to our stuff. We love our fish, we love our corals, and we can't imagine not having it. Uh, you could bank pieces with local friends, local hobbyists, and then when your tank is set up, have them ship you frags. And if they do a good job of shipping, you have nice pieces to restart with. Uh, that's another way of doing it. I One guy, he moved from here to another uh, state. I can't remember where. And he gave me a bunch of corals to take, to take care of in my reef. And when he was ready, I bagged them all up. I put them in a cooler, took them to FedEx, and shipped them overnight. And then he got all his corals back, and he put them in his tank. So that's another option. But yeah, I mean, there's just, I think we've all tried everything and it's just frustrating no matter what you do. Uh, Odile says, what can I do with my protein? I think he's talking about the protein skimmer. The top is hard for me to get off. I think we, you asked this question last week too. If you can put silicone grease on the area where the cup screws on to the body, you may be able to basically create it where it's not as difficult to remove. Uh, 
Uh, Scratchy Chan says one more question: Can you get burned tips from too high of you know too intensity of par, too high of a level of par? My alkaline is sitting at 8.5. My nitrates are 20. Phosphate's 0.2. I'm using the Kessel A360. The tips of your SPS could burn from excess light, you know, like it just it was a massive jump from whatever light you had before. You can trim off those tips and even put a drop of glue on the spots where you cut it off, and the coral should just completely regrow over it. If your light is too intense for some reason, you can you know the, you can turn down that Kessel. I know you can. You can run it a little bit less intense. You can also run it less long per day, and that way you can enjoy yourself. Uh, a nice pretty tank with uh, corals that are not getting burned. But yeah, it is possible to burn them with light. Bobby's Reef Aquarium says, my yellow tang has one white dot. Let me scooch this over so you can see all the words. One white dot on its side, like the size of a BB. I think it might be lymphocystis. What should I do? How do I cure it? I'm not a fish disease person. I'm going to tell you that up front. But you may be able to remove the fish from the tank, put in a small container of water at your table, and then you would carefully take the fish out of the water and lay it down on a towel and with tweezers pluck off that white thing and then put it back in the tank. That is how you handle lymphocystis. Uh, the, that stuff can just fall off the fish whenever the, it's done. And the fish, you know, it could just go away on its own accord. But I had a clownfish that had it on its body in two or three spots and I plucked it off and solved the problem. Maria says, do you have any good suggestions for additives or nutrients that I can add to my fish food to help them stay healthy and fabulous? The fish themselves are um, going to be colorful based on, number one, their genetic disposition, as well as the foods you use. So rather than flake food or, um, or pellet food, you might want to look at some of the frozen foods that are available. P.E. Mises has a good oil base in it, which is great for fish. It's uh, Rod's Food has the omega fatty acids and the, I never know how to say this word, astaxanthin or something like that. <laughs> I just read it and I'm like, okay, whatever. I don't know what that is. But it's in there and fish need it. Um, and uh, Larry's Food is another frozen food that's available. LRS, Reef Frenzy. These are all foods that are really rich and they cost more, but you can break off a small piece and use that in your aquarium and your fish can benefit from it. So it's not that you're feeding your fish caviar. I mean, yes, they're going to be eating well, but that food is also so rich you don't have to use a lot of it to keep the fish nourished. Um, I like to put in flake food during the daytime with my auto feeders and then do my frozen food every night before the lights turn off. Uh, Timothy says, would you ever use a sump for a six-gallon Pico Reef? I hate the hang back filter. Would love to simplify the look. There was a guy who had a beautiful, stunning, tiny, probably six-gallon Pico, maybe even smaller. And it was in the middle of this black table and just sat there. And then underneath it, he had a canister filter, and the pipe went down in the filter and back up into the tank, but you couldn't tell any of it. And then he had this articulating light, like a Pixar light, you know, like the Pixar lamp that was over it. It was so cool looking. And when he shared that video, he stole some song from some artist out of Australia. And... I mean, the tank was cool, but I loved the song so much. I was like, who's that artist? <laughs> and I must have listened to that video instead of watching it a hundred times because I love that song so much. But it was a really cool effect. But yes, you could hook up a sump to a small tank. And if you have a way to drain it down and pump it back up, absolutely. And you could have a huge sump under that six gallon and have this amazing filtration. And your little tank will have great water quality because you have room for all the equipment underneath. It's completely out of sight. No one sees it. No one hears it. And then you have this beautiful little biotope right there that seems very minimalistic. That could look amazing. Uh, All-in-One fan says, what's the biggest custom tank you've ever made and did you ship it? 
I wish I could order 180 gallon acrylic, but no one seems to have one available. Um, I think the biggest I've made was 90 gallons, and uh, I've made a bunch of 60s. But I'm not a tank builder. I, I really like to do sumps and things underneath because customers want the tank to be absolutely perfect. And if there's even the slightest flaw, they get really upset. <laughs> and I do my best. I, I, I want it to be perfect, but there's, it's so hard to be perfect. And so I've been avoiding the display tank for that reason specifically. But could I make 180 gallon? Possibly. Could I ship it? That's the challenge because it has to get, it's big and it's light. And something that size really needs to be put on a pallet. It needs to be crated to protect it from all six sides. And uh, the shipping company wants to charge a lot because it's so darn light. If the darn thing weighed tons, the shipping would be great. I've considered building tanks and then filling the tank with bags of sand just so the pallet is crazy heavy to get the better shipping rate. But I think that's insane. But at the same time, people would get the sand bed with their aquarium all in the same shipment. So I don't know. But uh, yeah, I'm just like, why do you care if it's light or heavy? I, if anything, it's good that it's light. You can put my pallet on top of a different pallet full of heavy things because you have all that empty space on the top in your truck. But who, what do I know? I'm not a truck hauler. You know, I just, I just wish that I could get better rates on shipping pallets. Uh, Roshan says, can I keep the kind of lid you showed on the display tank? He's talking about this one here. So he's saying, could I put this on the tank? Would I get a light reflection? A lot of things will happen with a lid. So number one, you'll um, get condensation on the underside. And that obstructs the light because there's condensation. There's droplets of water in the way. Algae can grow on the underside. Uh, the light can reflect off of it and bounce up into your eyes and irritate you. I mean, there's a lot of little nuances that are not beneficial. That's why we tend to not have tops on our tanks. But in this case, it was, she adamantly said over and over, I want this tank. She called it a hospital tank. She said, it has to have a lid. She said that over and over. Every time she wrote me, a lid, with a lid, a recessed lid. <laughs> and I was like, I got it. And then I finally thought, what kind of hospital tank needs a recessed lid? And then she, timed it, she told me it was a timeout tank. I was like, oh, okay, so she doesn't want the fish to be fussy or jump out. Because a lot of people prefer instead to use a screen top where you use a very fine mesh screen and it fits in nicely and cleanly and nothing can jump out. Um... Jason Langer says, so did you share? I got to go. <laughs> I need to finish another batch. He makes the beautiful fish cookies. And uh, no, I didn't share. Are you kidding me? Those are mine. <laughs> Tammy Trucker, I do not know your credit card number. That is not true. PayPal knows your credit card number. I don't. Uh, Jay's Reef says, which is more pure, RODI or distilled? I need to season a cigar box. Wonder if DI is fine. Well, DI is very pure, but distilled is considered the absolute purest of all water on the planet because it's made from steam. So I would say uh, distilled is the better choice. But I would call a cigar place and ask them what they think. Maybe they can tell you for sure. Will Mar says, what corals do you recommend for a 75 gallon saltwater tank that's been running for a year and a half with four reef safe fish? Um, I don't know the light fixture that you mentioned, the 156 LED bar, I don't know what that is. But if you have adequate light, you could pretty much have most any coral. Um, maybe look into some LPS corals and see what turns you on. Like in this video to my, I think I'm gonna point the right way. Yes, I got it, uh, <laughs> to my left. The, on the bottom there are two chalices, and then an astrea, and then another chalice, and then there's a moon coral, and then above the moon coral are a couple of really pretty lobos, and there's a cephastria. So there's a lot of stuff down there. Those are all LPS. 
And then if I move my video over to the other corner, on the other side over there, you can see my hammer corals, and there's a tongue coral down here at the bottom that that fish is swimming over. There's another hammer. I mean, there's a lot going on there. So there's a lot of choices. But um, I think that you could pretty much have a lot of nice choices in the San Gabriel Aquarium. It really does come down to, is that the right light? Uh, Alfredo says, on your experience, what are, what are the common local fish stores' rules on returning livestock? You need to ask them. Every store is going to handle that differently. There's not even a, a rhyme or reason. You just ne never know. <laughs> wow. So Tammy says, I've been having algae issues. My frog spawn, frog spawn was retracted and hated me for weeks. I added Ben Arif, and in five minutes she was happy again. Nice. I'm glad to hear that. No, uh, Benarif is a really great food. Uh, David Water says, do you do ICP tests on your tank? I have not done one in probably a year. I keep saying I'm going to, and I never get around to it. I need to get around to it. I haven't done it in a while. Last time I did it, pretty much all the numbers were where I was expecting, and the numbers I was curious about, like lanthanum, which I was expecting to be high, was actually lower than Fiji. So that was nice. Guess my skimmer does a great job. Hands of Stone says, what size is your tank? This one behind me is a 400 gallon reef. It's seven feet long, three feet wide, and 30 inches tall. Uh, Paul says, first of all, thank you for the super chat. And he says, I've got a 55 liter tank with two clonfish and there's red slime. So he's got the cyanobacteria problem. Um, it's a fluval Evo. Any recommendations to get rid of it? I have a wave maker. A sow four. I don't know what these things are. Um, I think you need to siphon out as much of the cyano from your tank with some flexible tubing and then possibly treat it with some red cyano RX or with ChemiClean, either of those two products. And then in a few days, whatever was left will have died off and then you can do a nice big water change on a little tiny tank, and uh, it'll be better. I mean, that is a small tank, 55 liters. That's got to be like 15, 16 gallons. So you could do a, a nice big water change on that tank and hopefully have no more cyano in your tank and be happy. Great Lakes Reaver, thank you so much for subscribing. And he said he said he started watching my videos. I'm glad you're doing that. Ken Houston says, what do you think about brine shrimp as far as supplement to frozen foods? I've always heard that brine shrimp is basically like potato chips. And uh, when I was feeding brine shrimp into my tank, I was actually hatching brine shrimp myself and you put the eggs in water and 24 hours later they're hatched and they have a yolk sac attached and those I used a very fine net to capture them. I put them in my reef because that was the most nutritious. But like full on full size adult brine shrimp are apparently snacks. They're nothing. So it's not really a great choice as a, um, a food for our reef. I mean you said supplement. So I mean if you want to throw something else in for fun, yes. When I got the copper band that's in my reef she was eating brine shrimp. So I bought a thousand brine shrimp or more from the fish store. I kept going back and getting giant bags of them and pouring those in the reef and all the fish were eating them. But I knew the copper man was getting some of the food it was used to. But I kept throwing in other foods with it at the exact same time to wean her off of it. And now she's eating mice shrimp and uh, PE mice, you know, the larger ones. I've seen her pick and chop at bits of krill. So I don't have to worry about having a lack of food in the tank, which is good. Uh, SJ says, best way to move corals from a T5 tank to a Hydro 52 lit tank. Just move them. See how it goes. Uh, Jim says, any thoughts on adding corals to a fallow tank? 
It's just like putting corals in a tank that have fish. You just need to feed the corals because there are no fish in there. Because normally we feed the fish and the fish poop and the poop feeds the corals. So you're going to have to make sure you give your reef some food. You could do the Benner Reef I was talking about before. I do sell it in the shop. Um, comes in three different sizes. And it's a really nice food that doesn't add nutrients to the water. So it doesn't add, uh, it doesn't create cyanobacteria. It keeps the glass clean longer. You don't see nitrate or phosphate spikes from using that food. So it's the one I'd like to recommend. Uh, David says, do you run a calcium reactor? And if so, what's the pH in your reactor? I do run one. I've been running one since 2004. It came with that 280 I mentioned earlier in the stream. And uh, I think right now it's running at 6.7. Ah. <laughs> Macy's daddy says, water tests are done. I have the opposite nitrate problem you have. And then Marcus said... <laughs> 14.53104359 gallons. So not even 15 gallons in that little tank. Thank you very much. Yeah, you guys are asking me to convert liters to gallons. I'm in America. I just don't know my liters. Um, Jason says, any recommendations on how to set up a quarantine for corals? It's not unlike doing a quarantine for fish, except better lighting. <laughs> So you're going to need flow. You're going to make sure you have good water quality in that quarantine tank. Um, you're going to want to maintain the levels in there. And how long are you keeping the corals in there? If this is basically like a miniature reef coral QT, you're going to have to dose alkaline and calcium to it, possibly magnesium, stay on top of water changes on a regular basis to provide all the essential elements and the uh, uh, trace elements. Uh, you could be doing something like Prodibio in there, for example. That might be nice. Um, but for me, when I did quarantine of corals, it was only in there for a few days or maybe even a week. It was just salt water, just circulating salt water with heat and air and light. And uh, that was good enough until I could take the coral out and dip it and put it into my tank. Uh, Tahoe says, is removing a mushroom covered live rock and replacing it with live rock from the sump a bad idea? You could swap them. I mean, the rock has been in the system anyway. Just remove it from the sump and put it back in the tank quickly so it's not exposed to air. Pluck the one out with the mushrooms that you uh, are wanting to remove. Scrape all the mushrooms off. And then you can put that rock back in your sump if you want. Or you can put it in a barrel of salt water for a day and then put it in your sump if you want. Uh, the longer the mushroom rock is out of the water, the more likely you will get some die off, which could lead to a cycle, which makes me kind of not want to put it in the sump initially. I think I do want you to put it in salt water for a little while kind of like make sure it settles down and then after a duration. Knowing me, I'd wait a couple of weeks and then I would grab it from that barrel and I'd put it in my sump. And then you wouldn't have the mushrooms anymore. Um, and then I, he had to follow up here. He said, I was going to scrub the rock. I wouldn't scrub it, number one. Never do that. And I would leave it outside for an extended amount of time and then reestablish it and put it back in. No, I would just take that rock I go to the kitchen sink or somewhere, you know, I don't know if you have a thing outside, you know, a workbench, and you can scrape off every mushroom. Wear eye protection, wear gloves, keep your mouth shut so nothing squirts you in the mouth. Scrape off mushroom after mushroom after mushroom till the rock is completely devoid. Then just put in some salt water and let it just sit there for, like I said, two weeks or so. And now you should be able to put that guy back in your sump. I wouldn't do the outside thing, and I definitely wouldn't scrub it. The reason you don't scrub things is when you scrub back and forth, it aerosolizes everything, and you inhale it, and then you get sick. Hands of Stone says, how long can a yellow tank be kept in the three-foot tank? Not very long. People get really upset about that. Um, not very long at all. I've got a hippo tank and a smaller tank, and people are been giving me grief for some time, and I haven't caught her yet, which is because she's not just saying, take me out. She's skittish. So I, at some point, I have to actually deal with that, and I haven't done it. But um, if it's a tiny little yellow tank, you know, one inch, inch and a half, it's one thing. If it's a nice, fat yellow tank, it needs a much bigger tank. Yellow tangs swim for days and days and days. What's a UK gallon? <laughs> Is a UK gallon different from an American gallon? Wow. I mean, I think I knew that, but I didn't I didn't think of it until you just mentioned it. He says there's 4.55 liters in a UK gallon.
Um, Michael Bowling says, do you have a coral food I can put in an auto feeder as a backup? The flakes seem to clump up in both auto feeders I have. Um, what auto feeder do you use anyway? I'm just curious. The, uh, the powdered foods just don't work well in auto feeders because they sit on the surface of the water and they just float down the drains and that doesn't benefit your corals. I'd rather see you have some kind of concoction that's mixed up and dosed into the tank, for example. <clears throat> like, what if you had a small little beaker and you put in the powdered food with water and you mixed it up so it's a slurry and you hooked it up to a dosing pump that then would just dose it into the tank for a couple of hours and then each day you refilled it. <laughs> or every few days. Why not do something like that? Uh, the auto feeders... I mean, I use Eheim auto feeders and they don't clump up at all. But maybe it's also where your auto feeders are. There's a lot of humidity and condensation and maybe that's the problem. There's not enough fresh air. Maybe it's the food. Maybe it's the feeder. I don't know. Uh, SJ says, does your giant chalice have long feeders at night? No. No, actually barely any sweepers come out of that chalice. Well, that's it. Um, we've been streaming now for a couple hours. This is a great time to stop. <laughs> this is my chance to run away before we get to the anemone cube. Um, listen, it's water test Saturday. You need to test your water today. It's very important that you do this and not neglect it. It's so easy to say, I'll do it tomorrow, and then you don't. So please do test your water today. Let's find out your alkalinity, calcium, magnesium, nitrate, phosphate, temperature, salinity. Those are all the good parameters that we want to know. Um, if your tank is new, you're going to also have to throw in their ammonia and nitrite. Um, and if it's a fish only, it's not as critical, but for us corals keepers and coral keepers, we need to know all the elements to make sure that our water is nice and stable and going really well. I say this to you guys every single week as well. Make sure your protein skimmer is clean. The neck of the skimmer is clean. You want to make sure that your dosing pumps are not clogged up to where nothing's coming out of them like they should. I've been urging you to put a small power head under where the dosing pumps trickle into your system so it mixes in the water rapidly and doesn't just turn into a solid sheet in the bottom of the edge of your sump or refugium. You want to make sure that that stuff is getting into the water column and your tank is benefiting from the alkalinity and the calcium magnesium you're dosing. Uh, if you're doing amino acids, that's another thing entirely, but make sure everything is dosing the right amount. When is the last time you calibrated your dosing pumps to verify they're still putting in the same amount you requested in the first place? That's another one of those things we need to do as a regular maintenance with our tanks to make sure everything is healthy and running properly so that the fish can thrive. So, and the corals, of course. Um, if you do all those things every single week, your tank will do much better than someone that doesn't do those things. So be that guy. <laughs> be that gal. And uh, take care of your tanks because they are relying on you and you are the one that will make all the difference. Thanks so much for tuning in for the live stream, and I will see you guys in Club Miller's Reef on Facebook. That's where we chat every single day, and I'm going to be working all next week doing more orders to keep you guys happy. Thanks so much, and we'll see you next Saturday. Bye!